If you would please join me in the book of Mark. We're going to be looking at chapter 5. If you're not real familiar with it, uh, Mark is in the New Testament, and so you keep going until you hit Matthew, Matthew, Mark, the second book of the New Testament. We'll be there in just a minute in chapter 5. Um, if you are tech savvy and you like to use the YouVersion Bible app, you can go there um, and hit the menu tab to the right and go under events, search for FBC Highland City, and you'll actually have sermon notes there that you can follow in case the screens don't work. Um, or I may need you to read the sermon notes to me because apparently this issue with technology is spreading and my Kindle just restarted. That's going to be fun. So we'll see where that goes in a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to give that a couple of minutes to come up, and while that's happening, I'm going to talk with you about a few things. And, and one of them is um, just I want to be able to say to my church family that I am incredibly, incredibly thankful for and proud of you. Um, what I love about big weekends like this is seeing how everybody pulls together. And all week long, people have been here and have been working Um moving chairs and tables and setting things up and cleaning things. The foyer, um, part of that was repainted. There was some lettering put on the wall. Some people donated some furniture. Bathroom floors got scrubbed. Uh, things got painted in here. Just an amazing time of watching people pull together, understanding that all of those tasks, whether it's cleaning a toilet or painting a wall, or designing how things were going to look in the foyer, all of those things work together for the same purpose. And that is that someone might hear the message that Jesus saves and, and commit to following him as their Lord and Savior. That's what all of that is about. That's why we exist. That's why we're here. That's why we do this whole church thing. It's not about coming here and being comfortable. It's not about having your favorite seat or singing your favorite song. It's not about having a pastor who's not long-winded. You're out of luck. Sorry. Like We just don't always get the things that we want. But what it is about is lifting up and exalting the name of the one who bore our sin, who took away our guilt and our shame, and restored us to God. And so for everyone that pitched in and did anything at all towards that, you are what this, what is God is working through to make all of this happen. And I am so thankful for you. And I think it's, it's an amazing thing that all of that happens to culminate on today. Not just being Easter Sunday, but being the Sunday that 70 years ago, Kenny MacArthur came forward in this church and joined this church family. And I'm talking about you. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought about wheeling you down front, but I didn't want to make this your last Sunday in church. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to point you out so everybody can see. She's the beautiful young lady in the back with the cute little hat on her head and the big smile. The one that is now saying, I regret holding this family in my pocket. 70 years ago, when this church was in a building on 98, she joined this church. And then she served, get this, 50 years in the nursery. Like, like now, that, now that that's sinking in, I understand why we have trouble getting people to work in the nursery. Kitty MacArthur spoiled you for 50 years, and it just takes time to overcome that. And you got used to it. Like, Kitty's going to be there. It's going to be all right. We don't have to do it. Well, that, that era has passed about 20 years ago. So, like, we, we need you to help watch those babies. And if you don't know what to do, she will... You will teach them, right? Because you know. <laughs> we are so thankful for you, Miss Kitty, and uh, for all of your time here, and for your love, and for your dedication, and that you still keep showing up. I want you to know that that is your ministry now. You show up, you encourage us. We know what you're going through. We, we know the struggles. And we're thankful for you every time I see you, well, Every time I hear you rolling down the hallway, like that lifts me up because I know you're here and I know what you went through to get here. So we love you and we are thankful for you, Miss Kitty. Also, I want to talk to you about someone else. Now, John can come of his own free will. So if you don't mind coming on down, John, I decided to not do this at the end of the service and do it now. And it's too late. You can't fire me. I've checked the bylaws and it's way too difficult. So don't even think about it. John is one of our deacons. And, um, John came to me a year and a half ago and said, you know, we used to do this Easter egg hunt thing, and I think we should do it again. 
And I don't know if he knew coming into that what my response was going to be. But I had no interest in doing an Easter egg hunt. I, I just didn't um, for a lot of reasons. But, but it, it just did not sound like something that I really felt like we needed to dedicate time to as a church. But he was so genuine. And like I said, I, I, don't know, I don't know if he knew what he was walking into when we first had that conversation. But he came prepared because the very next thing that he said was, I think we should do this. And then if you know John, like this next part sounds very natural. And it can be the biggest and the best ever. <laughs> and it's going to get bigger and better every year. And here's how we can use it as an outreach so that people can hear about Jesus. And so here was my thought. I don't know if I shared this with you yet. But here was my thought. I was like, I'm just going to see how this plays out. Because when you're a pastor, people come to you all the time with great ideas that typically they want me to make happen. And I just don't do that anymore. You can have all the great ideas you want that you're willing to make happen. Like, I will support you. And that was the conversation basically we had. Like, like we will come around you and support you if this is really on your heart and what you feel like you should be doing. And so he came. And for you leaders, committee heads, ministry leaders in, in this church, I want you to learn from what John did. Because the next thing he said was, can I come to church council and can I present a plan? And when he came, buddy, he knocked it out of the park. Best presentation I have ever heard from someone that had a great idea for what the church should be doing. And it was at that moment that I said, yeah, I'll, we'll do it. Whatever you need, whatever it takes, we will do it. Because I know you're invested and I know you get the purpose behind this. Um, and I know you're going to work hard. And so we did the first one, first relaunch last year. Great success. We learned a lot from it. We've been doing fall festivals for a while, so now we've kind of learned they run about the same. So each time we do one, we're learning a little bit, learning a little. And this ran the most smooth of any large event that we have done. I'm going to give you some numbers just because I want you to understand what got accomplished yesterday um, because it's pretty amazing. So we had 400-plus People on campus, around 450 or so. Some didn't register. Um, our count may have been off a little bit. So just guess, we had about 450 or so people on campus. They ate up 500 hot dogs. They hunted 5,000. Did you make it to 5,000? So close to 5,000 Easter eggs that, that you guys worked together to stuff with candy. By the way, I found some with chocolate in it. So you like, man, you weren't supposed to do chocolate. Just so you know, but it was a Milky Way, so that makes everything better. Um, but the most important thing is when you boil it all down is that at our ministry table where people came in and had the opportunity to talk with someone about Christ, six, decided, <laughs> seven, we're up to seven, awesome. So seven said, I want to follow Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that makes it all in And so I just want you to know that I'm, I'm thankful for you in your hard work. And I wish that we could have everyone that participated. But did I say also we had 60 plus volunteers here yesterday. Over 60 volunteers. So thank you guys for showing up. And many of them were not, a good portion were not even church members. They were friends and family members and some teens that needed some community service hours through school. And so we're just thankful for all of you. You did an amazing thing yesterday. And we, uh, the kingdom has been impacted because of your faithful. So thank you. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you. Guys. All right. So like I said, Mark, Chapter 5. And as, as we dive into this, I want you to picture a scene with me. You are pushing through a crowd, a crowd of people who are weeping and wailing and mourning, and you are pushing past that child in order to see, or sorry, pushing past that crowd in order to see a dead body. It's not Jesus. We're not there yet. This is actually the body of a 12-year-old girl. But you're following Jesus into this home. And so you push past the crowd. And almost, maybe, as I imagine, almost in, in aggravation, Jesus says as you're cutting through the crowd, why all of this commotion? Why all of this wailing? The girl's not dead. She's sleeping. <coughs> and that's going through your mind. And you're trying to kind of wrestle with that, other things that you've just seen. And you come into the door, and as the door is being closed, you hear the muffled laughter of the crowd that you just walked through. They were mourning, and now they're laughing as Jesus says the child is just sleeping. 
As you enter the room, you are hit, huge embrace by your spouse. All at once, you are aware of the immense amount of moisture that is coming from them as they are weeping. But then also, just this huge grief that just, you know, that grief that comes up from your belly as you look out and see the lifeless body. It's the story of a man named Jairus. On that day, for him, everything came crashing down. And in that moment, what Jesus asked of him is actually what he asked of all of us. Do you believe that he can raise the dead? Can you believe that he has the power to call that little girl up off of that bed? For Jairus, for us, can we believe that we can trust him with our souls? Can we believe that we can trust him with life and all the things that it throws at us and all the time that it feels out of our control and we feel like we're crashing down and that grief comes up within us or that frustration or that anger or the guilt or the shame? And we pass by. It's been lived out of, as a disconnect believe that he can raise you from the dead. That's the hope that we have in him. You see, the resurrection that he experienced was, was, it was proof of all the stuff he said. No doubt it was proof that he is the Son of God. It was proof that he has power to do all the things that he had promised. It's proof that we can trust in him for the future, but it also says that he can raise us up from where we are, from the pits of hell or depression anxiety or fear that he can reach and grab our hand and say rise and you will would you look with me it's a it's a little bit of a long passage we're actually going to meet a couple of different characters we're going to start matthew chapter five not matthew i'm sorry mark mark chapter five beginning in verse 20 nope still on the wrong page 21. When Jesus had crossed over by a boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd had gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. And seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and he pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and they pressed all around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered great under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak because she thought, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that she had been free. Pause there for a minute and pray. Father, we thank you for this moment and for these words, and we pray <clears throat> that you would draw us closer to you. We pray this morning for faith to believe. We <coughs> pray for healing, physical, spiritual, emotional, in every way, God. We, we plead that you would make us whole in you, that we would believe that we can rise and that we will rise with you if we will place our faith in your Son. I pray that today would be the day that we would be transformed and look more like you. For it's in his name that we pray. As we go through this amazing and at some points kind of strange event that took place, essentially what we're going to be doing is just looking at a few observations of what we can learn from the lives of these folks and, and how that impacts us today. And so the starting place, I feel like, for that discussion when we look at Jairus and his daughter and we look at this woman is that we've got to understand that we have no power over death. There is a day that is appointed for each and every one of us where we will breathe our lives, our laughs, our heart will stop beating, the brain waves in our brain will stop, and we will be dead. And there's nothing that we can do about that. CPR only works in certain circumstances when everything lines up and is just right. When I had trained to be an EMT and first got into working in the ambulance, 
my picture was like those those scenes that you see in ER and all those doctor movies. You know, they they do the chest compressions and they breathe in their mouth and they scream and they're oh boom right and, <coughs> and they're okay. Like that's not the way it works. Like I did CPR on a whole lot of people. Not very many of them live to tell about it, and that's not my fault. I'm just gonna put that out there. It's not my fault. That's that's just the way life works. There, it has to be just the right series of events, and CPR will bring someone back. Most of the time, you gotta use the paddles and shock them, and even then, it's it's empty. There's also a limit to doctors and to medication. And there's times that I'm sure you've seen, just like I have, where someone's gone to the doctor, gotten a diagnosis, gotten a treatment plan, medication, and they've recovered. But then there's been other times that they tried this medicine and that medicine and this treatment and that, and everything's exhausted, even sometimes surgery. And you'll come all the way to the end of that, and the doctor will say, I'm sorry, there's, there's nothing else that we can do. And then the strangest of all is cryonics. You guys know what that is? All right, so cryonics is the thought that, the theory that you can take someone's body right after they die and freeze them. And then when technology gets better, bring them back, resuscitate them back, treat them, and they'll be okay. Now, the weirdest thing about this is not just that you have to take the body and freeze it immediately, not just that they pump all the blood out and replace it with antifreeze. Yeah, you heard me, antifreeze. And not just that that body is going to sit in a tank of liquid nitrogen for who knows how long, but some cases, they don't do the whole body. Just a little. I ain't playing. Like millionaires are spending tens of thousands of dollars to do this in the hope that like a hundred years from now, someone's going to resuscitate them. You know what? If I check out, I don't want to come back in a hundred years. I'm not going to know anybody. Everything's going to be different. I mean, think about all the changes you've seen in your life. What if you're out cold for 100 years and then you come back? It's, it's not going to be good. I'd rather be in heaven. Like, it just makes sense. Like, I'd rather be in heaven. But the whole point of all of that is that death is coming, and there's nothing that we can do about it. What wealth do you have? Jairus was a rich man. As a synagogue ruler, he probably had a lot of money. But it didn't stop his daughter from dying. The flip side of that is that if this other woman, the woman with the issue of bleeding, if she had money, by this point it's gone. The scripture just said she spent it all. And not only did she not get better, she got worse. And she suffered under doctors because they did horrible things back then to try to cure people. And we put a whole lot of emphasis on money now. But money is not going to solve your problem when it comes to your last day and you take your last breath. Not only can you not take it with you, but it's not going to stop you. Neither is your status. You know, some of us begin to think that we're really important here. But no matter how important we are, it's not going to keep us from having that day when we stop. Jairus, as a synagogue leader, would have not only probably been wealthy, but he would have had a lot of, he would have had well standing within the community. They would have offered him the best seat. They would have made way for him as he walked through the courtyards and the marketplaces. They would have pointed at him and recognized him at events. He, he, he had status. The flip side of that is that this woman had none. If she did in the beginning, after 12 years of this bleeding problem, all of that was erased. Because we have to understand this in the context of their culture, which meant they lived by Old Testament law. Which means her bleeding problem would have ostracized her. Being considered unclean, nobody would touch her. Imagine 12 years when your family doesn't touch you, no one hugs you, no one kisses you. In fact, they may even back up because not only are they concerned about being contaminated by you being unclean, the assumption is that you probably got there because of sin in your life, and I don't want any part of that. I don't want to be associated with but then beyond that, if she was a religious person, this hurts even more because her concept of God would have been that you go to the temple because that is the symbol of and the place of his presence. But she can't go in the temple. So you've got a wealthy, well-regarded person and you've got a broke woman who, by the way, we're not even told her name. She's so insignificant in the scheme of things. Not to God. She's completely ostracized, yet both of them are in the same boat, facing mortality. 
Another thing that we've seen in this is that religion doesn't help. And understand me when I say that. I'm not saying that there is not hope in Christ. Obviously, I believe in that. But I do not believe in religion. Religion is me doing what I can do to earn my way to God. If, if, I, am, if I serve enough, if I love enough, if I give enough, if I hide enough Easter eggs, if I serve enough popcorn, if I'm a really good usher or greeter, if I give up 50 years of my life to wipe tinies in the nursery, then God's going to love me more. That's religion. It is an endless pursuit that never satisfies and only leaves us wanting something we can't grasp and shackled by something that weighs us down. The religion of Jairus did not keep his daughter alive. The religion of that woman, if she had any, did not prevent this suffering in her life. And it didn't give her any peace in her What we're going to see today as we continue on through the passage is that the one and the only hope for all of us and for them is Jesus Christ. The series of events in their lives brought them to a place where they were face to face with Jesus and they had to make a decision. What am I going to do with this guy? What does he mean to me? Is he just a good teacher? Is he just someone that I can look up to? Just a man of God, just a holy man. Or is he something more? Is he someone that if I really can reach him and grab a hold of his coat, can heal me from the inside? Is he someone that can call my daughter? At this point, back before she died. For us this morning, is he who he said he is? Is he really Lord and Savior? Is he really the soon coming king? Is he really the one on whom everything rests and the one who bore our sin and bore our sin and can heal us from everything that separates us from God? Who is Jesus? Both of them were brought to that point on the same day in the same minute. And we see in that that God's timing is perfect. And this is one of the most difficult things that you and I will grapple with. Let's continue on. Verse 29 again says, immediately after she comes to him, the thing, she grabs a hold of his, his robe. The bleeding stops and she actually feels in her body that she's been healed, that she's been set free. At once, Jesus realized that the power had gone out of him. And he turned around to the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the disciples answered. And yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling in fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. But while he was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? God's timing is always perfect. So far, what we've seen in this is that Jairus has had his daughter for 12 years, his precious daughter for 12 years. She has no doubt given him joy. She has no doubt warmed his heart. She was, I'm sure, the most beautiful of all the children that were around him, as all parents feel about their kids. And now, after 12 years, she lays there dying, and there's nothing that he can do about it. And during that same period of 12 years, this woman has been suffering. She's been suffering with this uncontrollable bleeding that is going on in her body. She can't stop it, and the doctors can't fix it. And both of them come to the end of their rope after 12 years, clinging to Jesus and hoping that something's going to happen. And for her, on that day, in that moment, as soon as she sees him, as soon as she touches him, she's healed. But then there's Jairus. Can you imagine the nights of watching his daughter suffer? Can you imagine the long days of not being, trying to function without sleep? Worrying about your kid. Am I a good dad? Am I doing enough? Have we really found the best doctors? 
And then finally he sets everything aside and goes after Jesus because the religious leaders of the day had rejected him. So Jairus in this day as he goes to Jesus is risking everything, all of that wealth, all that status, his position in the synagogue is all being risked. But he doesn't care because he thinks that maybe Jesus can help. And he finally gets to him. And now they've got to fight for the crowd. You know, all those, all those times where you come to the end of the rope and you're, you're like, I can't wait anymore. And you feel like God's going to answer your prayer. It looks like everything's lining up. I think we're finally going to be okay. And then the bottom falls out. This lady stalls Jesus for maybe five minutes. Long enough for news to reach that you don't need Jesus anymore. Your daughter's Probably everyone in this room has been at a time where you're waiting on something from God and you feel like you can't wait anymore. It's just taking too long. God's giving me more than I think I deserve. I, I can't do another day. I can't do another minute. I can't pray anymore. I can't cry anymore. this will be helpful to you or not in the short term, but I want you to know that that's a, a proving ground, that's a, a place of growth that God intentionally allows into our lives. If you go all the way back to the beginning, most, if not all, of the major characters throughout the Bible have had these intense waiting periods in their life. He, he told Abraham that if he would just follow him, he would give him a son, and he would give him an inheritance, and he waited decades to see that fulfilled. And then comes Joseph, and, and Joseph was faithful to God, and Joseph was given a dream as a little boy that's not fulfilled until he's much older, and in between, he has to wait as a slave, and he has to wait in prison. Moses, at least two different times in his lifetime, had to wait on God for 20 years plus. David was anointed king at a young age, and probably 12 to 15 years later took the and in between had to run for his life. The Apostle Paul, after he finally comes to Christ and walks away from persecuting the church and throwing Christians in jail and all of that stuff, has this waiting period where he goes in the desert and he spends time on his knees before God, studying and praying and being drawn close to the Almighty. If you're in a place of waiting and you feel like you can't wait anymore and you're frustrated, maybe you're in a place where you're doubting God, maybe you're doubting your salvation, maybe you're just doubting that, that he even cares, maybe he's there, but you're just not important. You're in good company. Because it's, it just seems to be a necessary part of our development as God allows us to go through these waiting times. In, in James 1, it talks about how we should count it as joy when we go through trials of many kinds because those trials develop perseverance and patience which lead to growth in Him. And what we can learn most of all in those waiting periods is that God's timing is perfect. At just the right time, these two people come to the end of their world. At just the right time, they, they cry out to Jesus when he's available. For her, she is healed immediately. For Jairus, he's going to suffer a little bit longer. Picking up in verse 36, Jesus ignores those who come and he says, don't be afraid, just believe. He didn't let anyone follow him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw the commotion, and the people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and he said to them, why all this commotion and why are you wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. After Jesus had put him out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples that were with him. And he went in together where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said, Talitha Tuma. Means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up. She walked around. She was about 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anybody know what had happened. And he told them to give her something to eat. We 
see in this that death is nothing to Jesus. That doesn't mean that our pain is nothing. That doesn't mean that our grief is nothing. Because you can go to a similar event when Jesus is going to call Lazarus out of the grave. And as he comes and he sees that grieving family, he grieves with them. He weeps with them. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't even say, just hold on a minute and I'm going to call him out of the grave. He weeps. that verse the first time when I was 12 years old. I was in fifth grade Sunday school and the teacher went around the room and asked everybody what Bible verse do you have memorized? There were two that came out. All the girls quoted John 3.16. All the boys quoted Jesus' way. <laughs> it's amazing because that really is a whole verse. Those words, Jesus wept. But it says so much. That God knows our grief. And that God knows our sorrow. And when we go through those heavy times, we're not alone. He cares. And so when I say that death is nothing to Jesus, I'm not saying that he doesn't care about the way you feel and the things that you experience as you have lost loved ones. But what I'm saying is that it has no victory over him. It tried on the cross. It tried to take his life. In that moment, as the nails went through his hands and through his feet, and he hugged on that cross, and as we talked about last week, as he, as he agonized over his breath, and as he suffered for those six-plus hours, Hanging there, not only enduring the physical pain and shame of hanging there naked in front of everyone, but he also had the guilt and the shame of having all of our sin, every bad thought, every bad thing that we have done, all poured on him in that moment. He bore that. The Bible says literally becoming sin, but he knew no sin because he was the perfect and spotless Lamb of God. And all of our wretchedness was poured on him so much so that the Father rejected him and turned his back on him in that moment. But that could be it. Because that was God's plan out of his great love that Jesus would suffer those things so that you and I could be made clean and wash all shame away so that we could be restored to God and so that we could have a hope in him. And so death tried. What I love about this moment is that it's like almost the polar opposite of what he did with Lazarus. I love how creative that he is. You know, with Lazarus, he gets everybody around and they stand in front of the tomb and he lifts his eyes up to heaven and he prays this prayer to God, basically saying, I'm praying this, I know you know and I don't need to tell you, but I want them to hear and then with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And in this moment, he could have done the same thing. Little girl, little girl, get up. Stand to your feet. He could have strained a little bit, could have let some sweat beat on his forehead. But in this intimate moment with his weeping Remember what he said to the dad? The moment the messengers arrived, she's dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. It's okay. Just believe it. And with confidence and with amazing power, Jesus sat down on that bed. He grabbed her hand. And there's really not a literal translation for what it says. If you, if you take it for the meaning, Basically, he said, sweetheart, it's time to get up. You see, death has no power over him, and so it was, it was no greater feat for him to call that girl back from death than it would be for you or I to wake our children up from the dead. He didn't need to posture. He didn't need to speak loud. He didn't need to strain. It, it didn't make him weak. He didn't flex his muscles at all. He sat beside her and he took her hand calls her back from death, and he can do that because he is the author of life. 
See, all the way back in Genesis, John 1 tells us that in Genesis, when it says God said, let there be light, and God said, let there be this, and God made trees and plants and all of that, that it wasn't just God the Father, it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because in John 1, 1, we're told that nothing has been created without Jesus, which also means that when God stooped down and he looked into Adam's lifeless face, and he breathed the breath of life into him, that Christ was in that moment. That Jesus is the author of life. And so it was no big deal for him to reach down to this girl and to wake her up. But Jesus also said, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. Meaning that life resides in him. He is the giver of life. He is the sustainer of life. We're told in Colossians, he's before all things and in him all things hold together. I love science. And so I had a lot of fun this last summer when, when we talked about how big God was. And we did that with talking about stars and all of those things. But I also love Things that science cannot explain. And so a few years ago, I did some research after coming across this verse. It's in Colossians 1. I, I don't know what happened to my brain. I just left off the rest of it. Like, Colossians, guess where? Uh, but, but anyway, I came across this passage sometime, and it intrigued me. And so I began to study gravity. And you know that physicists cannot tell us where gravity comes from. Can't say. They can measure it. They can look at its effects. They know it's there, and we know it's there on a microscopic level. Like, not only does the sun and the moon and the earth have gravity, but your chair has gravity. You have gravity. The molecules in your body have gravity. And nobody knows why, and nobody knows what, how it came about, and nobody knows if it's going to last except us. Because we know that the one who is the author of the life of life and the one who's the way and the truth and the life is the one that has the power to literally hold the universe together. And if he can do that every moment of every day, then calling someone back from the grave is no big deal. And so here's what that means for us. Here's how all of this ties into the Easter story. You and I are a lot like that little girl and a lot like that man. May not be on your deathbed yet, but we're all heading there. But more than that, we all have things that are beyond us. Things that we can't control. Things that sometimes make you afraid or anxious. Some things that make you excited this, this weekend. And it may have happened already because I don't have my phone. Um, but, but Ellen is, is away, away in the birth of her first grade child. And what a sweet, amazing moment they're looking forward to. Victoria, her daughter-in-law, was induced, um, I think, early this morning. Um, Taryn flew back from overseas. He's serving the Army was there from overseas. And so the whole family is there. And they're just waiting for this precious. Now, like, like when you've been there, you, you know, like, that's just the, the most amazing moment. Those moments even sometimes can bring us to the point to where we say, I don't, I don't even know what's going on in my life anymore. Uh, Victoria and Terry are definitely going to be thinking that in about two days, right? Like, I don't even know what's going on in my life anymore. I don't even know day from night or what's, which way I'm, I, 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 I'm doing good if I brush my teeth and comb my hair today. And these people, Jairus and this woman, they found themselves at the end of the road. They didn't know what to do. What they knew to do was come to Jesus. And, and what the Bible tells us is that the death that he died not only was our death, but it defeated death. So that the life that he lives now, we can live with him. And so if you would just take your Bible and go to one other passage with me. Romans chapter 6. I just want to read to you some really powerful words that bring all of this together. In Romans 6, beginning of verse 4, it says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Jesus was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, 
that we no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we know, we believe that, we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die. Death no longer has mastery over him. If death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. All of that boils down to you and I, because of our rebellion against God, because God said, I want you to live this way, and I want you to live like this, and I want you to honor me, and I want you to worship me, and I want you to have a relationship with me. And every one of us has said, I don't need that. I know how to run my life better than you do. Get out of my face. Every one of us has said that at some point in your life. The moment God says do and we say no, that is exactly what we say. It is rebellion. It is idolatry. Get out of my face, God. I don't need you. And the penalty for that, the Bible says, is death. Physical, emotional, spiritual. Death in every way. And we have hope. Because God loved us so much that he couldn't leave us in that condition. If he had, he still would have been God because he is holy and he is righteous and he is just. And it would have been completely okay. No one could say anything bad about God if he just said, you know what? You chose death and death it will be. But instead, his great love drove him to sacrifice Christ on our behalf and make us whole. And you may not have a catastrophe in your life like Jairus did or like this other woman did. Maybe you don't need uh, a physical healing. Maybe, maybe you're not at the point of really thinking about death and being concerned with death yet. But here is what I know, that for every single one of us, life hits us in the gut at some point. For every single one of us, there's this inner need to know and to be known by someone, to be accepted and to be loved and to be part of a family. And I want you to understand what I'm about to say. I'm not saying come to Jesus so that you can get heaven. I'm not saying come to Jesus so you feel better about yourself. I'm not saying come to Jesus so you can belong to something or have purpose. I'm saying come to Jesus so you can have Jesus. But all those other things come in. Every single one of us. God has privileged me over the last six months to walk with some people through imaginable sorrow and pain. And in every one of their eyes, I have seen a need for someone to be there. I've had countless people come into my office and look me in the eye and say, everything's okay. And I know it's not true. Because within all of us, we understand that we need God, whether we want to admit it or not. Our hold up is we don't want to obey Him. But we really do need Him. And we really do want to be loved by Him. And we really do want to be connected in and accepted by Him. The problem is that, that we just feel like we're giving up too much. But the reality is we gain everything. In 1987, there was a plane that was taking off near Detroit, and there was a mechanical failure shortly after takeoff, and it just came right back to me. 154 people on that plane died like that. Two people on the ground also perished in the plane. There was one survivor, a four-year-old little girl named Cecilia. Initial reports after the crash said that she survived was traveling with her mom and her dad and her older brother. An initial report said that she survived because moments before that plane impacted the ground, her mom unbuckled her seatbelt. Her mom engulfed that four-year-old with her body, and that mom absorbed the impact on her behalf, saving her life. Cecilia is in her 30s now. She doesn't remember that. There's no way to know for sure. But whether that rumor is true or not, in that is a beautiful picture of what Christ did for us. Because of our sin, we were plummeting towards destruction. And when Jesus opened his arms and embraced the cross, he embraced all of the stuff that was coming towards us. He embraced guilt. He embraced shame. He embraced loneliness and fear. And anxiety, he embraced lust, he embraced want, he embraced depression, he embraced the feeling that nothing and no one cares or matters or does make a difference. He took all of that impact for us and let us walk out free. And when he 
walked out of the grave. He, he showed us what that new life can look like. Everything that we have done over this weekend has point, pointed to this moment so that we can tell you about God and his love for you. And you can make a decision. Same decision that Jairus and this woman had to make. Will you believe in Jesus and what he says? Will you believe that God loves you? Will you believe that you belong and are accepted? That you don't have to feel guilt and shame for the past? That you can walk with your head up, not in pride, but in complete and utter acceptance and love? Will you belong to someone more? And that someone counted you so dear that he gave it all to you? We're going to sing a song in, in just a minute that's a celebration of what it's going to be like when we stand in his presence. And I want you to know that no matter what life brings to you from this day moving forward, that there is a day that you're going to stand before him. And in this moment, you get to choose if that is a celebration and an act of worship or if that is the last time that you see God's face. My encouragement to you this morning is that you would come to him and simply say, I believe. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that in these remaining moments that you would help us to be still and to be quiet. God, I pray that you would help us to, within our hearts, to understand our need to have a loving Savior, our need to have a gracious and merciful God, our, our need to be restored to that place that we once were as a people. And I pray that all across this room, Father, that you would give the faith needed to believe that. And I pray also that you would help those of us who are believers to, to latch on to those who trust in you today and to help them to grow. If you would just kind of stay in, in an attitude of prayer. If you're, if you're a believer today, if you're a follower of Christ, I'd like you to just kind of reflect over what Jesus did for you. The incredible price that he paid draw you to himself. And I just want you to breathe out of prayer. And it just says something like, God, I am thankful for your son. God, I am thankful for your love. I'm thankful for your forgiveness. And I commit today in a fresh way to follow you wherever you call me. To be faithful to you at home to be faithful to you in the office, to be faithful to you at school, to be faithful to you in every place, in every context. If you are unsure, or maybe there's a bit of voice from inside you that is just kind of springing to life over the course of today, and you say, you know, I've heard of Jesus, and I've known of him as a historical and religious character, but I've not had that moment where I have believed like transferred that from my head to my heart and, and truly clung to him as Lord and Savior and committed to follow him. If you identify with that and that's you in this moment, my, my prayer is that you would just say something like this, like, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe in who you are. Jesus, I believe what you did. You died in my place. That you have set me free from death and sin. And you have set me free from shame and worry, anxiety, and lust, and all the darkness of this world. I believe that you did that in my place, and I believe that you rose again. And today, I commit to following you. In Jesus' name.